Chapter Thirty of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Thirty. It shall not be all suspense. Since the coming of Mr. Trent, who had secured rooms next door to the house occupied by Miss Ross and her niece, it had become my habit to pass an hour, more or less in Miss Jenrys's parlours each day, in the afternoon or evening, as was most convenient, and often, besides Mr. Trent and of late Miss O'Neill, Lossing made one of the party, for he had come to know as much almost as any one of us concerning Gerald Trent's strange absence. On leaving the scene of the fire, it was important that I should have a few words with Dave Brainerd, and this done, I was as ready to set out for Miss Jenrys's cosy apartment as was Lossing, for I felt with him that Monsieur Voisin must no longer be permitted to annoy the ladies, even for the good of the cause in which I was so deeply interested. Imagine my surprise, then, when I learned privately and from the lips of Miss Ross that Monsieur Voisin had been there in advance of us and had gone, seated in the little rear parlour with the portiere drawn, the clear-headed little Quakeress told me the story of his visit. I had observed upon entering that June Jenrys was not quite her usual, tranquil, self-possessed self, that her cheeks wore an unwanted flush, and that her eyes were very bright and restless, while there seemed just a shade of nervousness and a certain repressed energy in her manner. Miss Ross had led me, with little ceremony, into the rear room, and she lost no time once we were seated. "'I don't know what thee may have on thy mind this evening,' she began, "'but whatever it is, I will not detain thee long. Monsieur Voisin has been here. He left, indeed, less than an hour ago. I have had a talk with June since, and she has allowed me to tell you of his call. The man came here between four and five o'clock. In spite of myself, I started.' He had left the grounds with a bleeding face little more than an hour earlier. He was pale, and at one side of his face was a small wound, neatly dressed, and covered with a small strip of surgeon's plaster. He was labouring evidently under some strong mental strain, and I was not much surprised when he asked June for a private interview, and in such a supplicating manner that she could hardly refuse. Of course, he proposed to her, and in a fashion that surprised her. His pleading was so desperate, his manner so almost fierce. He begged her to take time, he implored her to reconsider, and he went away at last like a man utterly desperate. At the last he forgot himself, and charged her with caring for an adventurer, a penniless fortune-hunter, who might forsake her at any moment. And then he recounted word for word, the things said in that conservatory episode, the things that were imparted to Mr. Lossing. The scoundrel! Even so, this was too much for June's temper. She ordered him out of her presence, and in going he uttered some strange words, the purport of them being that before leaving this place she might find that Mr. Lossing had vanished out of her life and gone back to a more congenial career, and that she might be glad to turn to him to beg such favours as no other man could grant, and he ended by saying, that had she put him in the place of friend and confidence rather than you, he might have made straight the crooked places that were troubling the peace of herself and some of her friends. I was fairly aglow with excitement when she paused, and I told her at once my story of the day's happenings. Tell Miss Jenrys, I said, that I can, at the right time, explain all the riddles he has astonished her with and ask her to be patient yet a little longer and then i went back to the others to tell mr trent and hilda o'neill that i had now traced the kidnappers of young trent so closely that i had only to sift one block of a certain street to find this gang and i believed their victim and in spite of wonder and question i would tell them no more one of the next morning's papers contained this interesting item, followed up by a copy of the letter sent by Mr. E. Rowe on the square to Mr. Trent. The Trent Mystery 
there is hope that the mystery of the disappearance of young gerald trent of boston may soon be cleared up and there is reason for thinking that the enemy is weakening not long since a letter signed by the familiar name of roe was received by mr trent and promptly handed over to the officers this letter we print herewith mr trent is now in this city and there have been singular discoveries of late it is quite probable that mr trent even now will compromise the matter provided his son is returned to him safe and unharmed for strange as it may seem to expose and punish the miscreants it would be necessary to bring into prominence two ladies of fortune and high social standing who innocently and unwittingly have been made to play a part in this strange affair for their sakes doubtless a quiet compromise and transfer will end this most singular affair the row letter reads as follows here of course came the letter which miss o'neil had copied at length for her friend and which in the original had been sent by mr trent to me when this notice had been read by the ladies and by mr trent i was besieged for an explanation of what seemed to them an unwarranted withdrawal from the battle but my purpose once explained they were readily appeased and their faith in me restored it was true that i had tracked the clique to very close quarters but it was one thing to know that in one house out of half a dozen were lodged all or part of the gang but it was another thing to move upon them in such a way as to secure them all and at the same time rescue and save young trent if he were really in that unknown house and really alive it was this problem that was taxing all my ingenuity and which as yet i had not quite solved i had called alone on this afternoon lossing being on guard and when the newspaper sensation had been explained and i was about to go miss ross with whom i had grown quite confidential walked with me to the outer door friend masters she said gently i wish thee could tell me something about young mr lossing the words flung out by monsieur voisin were malicious words and meant to do harm but are they not partly true june is a proud girl but i am sure she feels this reserve of his and he is reserved i love the lad he seems the soul of truth but there is a strangeness a part that is untold my friend you whom we call upon for everything can you not make straight this crooked place too she put out her hand and smiled upon me and her gentle voice was full of appeal and i took the hand and held it between my own while i answered i believe i can do it miss ross and i surely will try and that at once it shall not be all suspense End of chapter 30